Hi, in this video I'm going to be going through the process of upgrading an Amstrad 464 Plus to 6128 Plus specification. For those that don't know, the Amstrad CPC was a range of Z80 based 8-bit British microcomputers from the 1980s. Despite being released a little later than competitors such as the ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64, it eventually became the third best selling computer in the UK and it did even better in France and Spain. It had a number of great features for both gaming and serious use like high resolution 80 column text and graphics, a lovely colourful palette, and a well-written operating system and basic implementation. Despite all this, it came at a very low price. A full Amstrad CPC setup with monitor and tape drive was basically the same price as a Commodore 64 by itself. The Plus range was a somewhat failed attempt to revitalise the CPC range for the 90s, which featured a redesigned form factor, some extra graphical features, and the ability to load games from cartridges rather than tape or disc. They also brought out a Plus-based console called the GX4000, which only played cartridges, and it was even less of a success. I remember seeing new ones retailing for less than a tenner at one point. The Plus range comes in two variants, the 464 and 6128. The 464 had 64k of RAM and loaded software from cassette tapes, and the 6128 had 128k of RAM and a built-in disk drive. I have the 464, but I'd like to be able to use disk-based 128k software, so let's get upgrading. This can be done just by soldering some extra components to the circuit board rather than by adding an external expansion like would be required in the original CPC 464. This is possible because the 464 Plus and 6128 Plus actually have identical motherboards. It's just that the 464 Plus leaves out the components related to the disk drive and extra RAM. For me personally, this is the best CPC setup as it lets you load the widest possible variety of CPC software in the smallest desk footprint. It has a built-in tape drive for tape software and for disk software you can just put the disk drive on top of the 464 for a super compact setup. The magazine Amstrad Action called this configuration the CPC Super Plus, as it's technically more capable than even the 6128 Plus. You could add an external tape unit to a 6128 Plus, but that would take up more desk space than the 464 Plus, as most tape players would be too large to go on top of the computer like the disk drive can. You could also add a disk interface to the original 464 to much the same effect, but then you wouldn't have the ability to play Amstrad Plus games, and as the OG 464 is one long boy, the setup would use even more desk space. Not to mention the rarity of DDI1 disk interface these days, although there are excellent third-party alternatives like the DDI3 by Zaxxon. Anyway, there are a number of different ways you can perform this mod depending on your requirements. The setup in this video is the one that best suits me, as I only want to connect a single GoTek floppy emulator to my 464. If you want to do something different, like add a real floppy drive or multiple drives, then the setup will still be mostly the same, but you might have to do some funky stuff with cable pinouts and external power supplies. I'll leave some hints in the video description. Before we do anything, let's examine the system in its current state. I've built a little adapter cable to allow the CPC to be powered from a USB power supply, and this abomination is an 8 pin DIN video and audio connector that I made by epoxying the pins from another DIN connector together. I use that to connect to this, which is a GBS 8200 upscaler board. It converts the CPC video to VGA for display on a standard monitor like this one. I do have an Amstrad CTM640 monitor, but it's too awkward and heavy to set up in my workshop, and in any case would require an adapter cable to plug into the plus range anyway. Powering it up lets us choose between Amstrad Basic and the included game Burnin' Rubber. We of course want Basic since we want to verify that this computer has no disk controller hardware or 128k of RAM. Running the run command by pressing Ctrl Enter prompts us to press play on tape. This proves that we have no disk controller hardware as the system is defaulting to tape mode. To prove we only have 64k of RAM, we'll need a 128k only tape game. The only one I have is this demo for uh, Adam's Family that came with the June 1992 issue of Amstrad Action, which as it warns on the tape sleeve, this game is needs 128k to run, sorry. Anyway, loading up the menu and trying to select the game warns us that we indeed don't have enough memory. Another way to test this via the Arnold 5 test cartridge, which I've burned to a ROM and put in this GX4000 homebrew cartridge I got from Retro Electronic. As you can see, it only detects four banks of RAM. Each bank is 16k, so that's 64k in total. So now that we've checked that we do actually need to perform this upgrade, let's perform this upgrade. We're mostly going to be using the Guidon CPC wiki as a reference, which I'll link you to below, but issues 90 and 91 of Amstrad Action also include some very useful hints so I'll give you a link to those too, as I've uploaded some decent quality scans of the relevant articles. Special thanks to my mum and dad for digging my original copies out of their attic and scanning them for me. They've been sitting there since I was eight years old. 
Firstly, let's talk parts. The most important components are of course the ICs, and they can be obtained from a number of places. The Glue Logic ICs 5, 6 and 7 are still being manufactured, and I got mine new from the UK component supplier Farnell. I'll provide a shopping list in the video description. But unfortunately the RAM ICs 12 and 13, and the disc controller ICs 3 and 4 are obsolete. They are, however, still widely available on eBay. Whether these are new old stock or reclaimed and remarked used components will depend on where you buy them from, but if they seem suspiciously cheap, maybe buy a couple extra in case some of them arrive broken. There may be more modern equivalents of these chips that would work just as well, but I've not personally attempted this. The passive components, namely the resistors, capacitors and inductor, can all still be readily obtained new from, in my case, Farnell, and I'll include them in the shopping list in the video description. However, if you're going to be messing about with electronics, it's worth just buying big kits of assorted resistors and capacitors from eBay. In my workshop, I have trays of them sorted into value groupings, and that's what I used for this project. If you're doing the install the way I'm going to be doing it, you also need a couple of male-to-female DuPont wires and a standard PC floppy ribbon cable. But if you want it to end up more like a normal 6128+, Plus, you'll also need a 36-pin Centronics connector. We'll talk about that a bit later. The 464 Plus is super easy to dismantle. We start by removing half a dozen screws from the bottom of the computer and undoing the three clips to allow the top section to be lifted off. The yellow and blue cables should be disconnected from the motherboard, then the top section put somewhere safe. The motherboard can be removed by unplugging the keyboard ribbon cable and tape connectors and taking out the screws holding it in. We'll do the 128K upgrade first, since it's the easiest part. This involves the two RAM chips IC12 and IC13, their associated decoupling capacitors C12 and C13, and two resistors to enable the extra RAM, R28 and R55. Unfortunately, the pads these components are intended to solder into are already full of solder. This is a consequence of the wave soldering process that Amstrad used, so we have to suck the solder out of these holes first. The best way would be using a vacuum desoldering pump or solder sucker hand tool, but I've lost mine so I had to use desoldering braid. This made the whole process much more time consuming, not to mention expensive, as good quality braid isn't exactly cheap, but it works just as well. Once the pads are suitably clear of solder, we can insert the ICs. Since these are older chips, it's probably a good idea to put them in sockets so they can be easily replaced, as we don't know what sort of life they've had. I didn't have any IC sockets of the correct size, so I just cut down some larger ones and, using the IC itself as a jig to hold them in the correct position, soldered them in. Sorted. The resistors are a bit easier to install, but as the resistors I had were quarter watt resistors instead of eighth watt ones, I had to bend one of the legs over and install them vertically. If you order eighth watt resistors especially, you might be able to fit them straight in, but it's really not much of an issue. Now it's time to see if we've broken our computer. To avoid having to have the top of the case installed, it's probably worth putting a jumper over the power switch connector. Now reinstall the motherboard into the case, connect the keyboard ribbon and tape drive, plug in the video connector and system cartridge, and finally connect the power. Hopefully you should get the standard startup menu, and basic should start as expected. Now, on loading Adam's family, we no longer get the 128k error message, and the game starts loading. Unfortunately, I think my copy of the game has deteriorated over the years, as it never actually finished loading, but the Arnold 5 test cartridge correctly detects all 8 banks of RAM, and the test completes with no problems, so I think we can call the first part of our project a success. Now onto the slightly harder part, installing the disk drive support. As before, the pads we need to install components in are filled with solder, so suck or braid them out. These components are ICs 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7, resistors 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and 29, which might already be fitted on some boards, in which case just ignore it, and capacitors 3, 4, 20, 21, 22, 23 and 39. Also, inductor L04 may need to be installed, we'll talk about that later, and connectors JD04 and CD04. That's over a hundred pads, so stick on your favourite Amstrad podcast and get sucking. Now it's just a case of populating all the components. I'm not going to bother putting ICs 5, 6 and 7 in sockets, as they're brand new and unlikely to be faulty, but I will for the obsolete ICs 3 and 4. Again, I had to snip a socket down to size for IC3, but remarkably I had a socket the perfect size for IC4, how about that? I advise just working down the list of components on CPC Wiki in order so you don't lose track of where you are. First the resistors, again if you're using quarter watts you'll need to mount them vertically. Resistor 29 was already populated on my CPC, which was very nice of Amstrad. Now the resistor network. Unfortunately nobody seems to make 7 pin bust resistor networks anymore, but there are a couple of ways we can get around this. Probably the easiest is to just buy a 9 pin one and snip a couple of the legs off. I've included one in the shopping list in this video description. The dot on the resistor network is above the pin that should be soldered to pin 1 on the board. But unfortunately I only had this idea after I'd done my Farnell order, so what I ended up doing was building my own resistor network out of discrete 680 ohm resistors, using a prototyping breadboard as a makeshift jig to get them all lined up, then soldering them all together using the leg of one of the resistors to join them all together. This leg gets soldered to pin 1 just like before. 
Next comes the capacitors, and most of them solder straight in with no hassles, but there are some caveats with capacitors 21 and 23. You see, they each have a bodge wire occupying one of the holes we need to insert the capacitor's legs into, which connect an IC and resistor to a ground plane on the other side of the board. I'm not sure why these are required, as these components are already connected to ground, but perhaps the impedance of the traces were too high and this provides a more direct route across the board. Anyway, what I did was desolder the wires entirely, install the capacitors as normal, then solder the wires back into the bottom of the board. There's another caveat with capacitor 39, as it has to be soldered in the correct way around. Electrolytic capacitors have a white line down the side to indicate the negative pin, and this pin should be pointing towards the rear of the CPC. If you don't do this correctly, the capacitor will explode in quite a spectacular fashion, so be careful. But hold on a sec. Capacitor 39 and L04 are used to filter out noise coming from the floppy motor on the 5 volt rail. Technically, in my case, this isn't required, as I'm going to be using a GoTek floppy emulator, which has no motor at all. But I decided to install these components anyway, just for the sake of completeness. If you decide not to, you'll need to bridge the pads on L04 with a piece of wire or something, and just leave C39 out completely. Now we need a way to connect the board to a floppy drive. We have a number of options here. The official way would be to install a 36-pin Centronix connector to the pads marked JD04 at the back of the board, but this has a number of disadvantages. My preferred approach was to take a standard 34-pin floppy ribbon cable, cut one of the plugs off it, and solder it directly to JD04. This means we have the advantage of not having to modify the case at all, as there is enough clearance between the two halves of the CPC's case to allow the cable to come through without pinching it. We also have the advantage of being able to plug it straight into a standard floppy drive with no weird adapter cables. The pinout of JD04 is basically the mirror image of a standard floppy connector, so pin 1 on the cable, which is usually coloured red, should be connected to pin 2 of JD04. Pin 2 of the cable goes to pin 1 of the socket, pin 3 of the cable goes to pin 4 of the socket, pin 4 of the cable goes to pin 3, and so on. The only disadvantage is it's a bit fiddly to strip and solder all the wires, but if you make a light score on each side of the ribbon, you can carefully pull the insulation off all at once. When soldering them into the pads, I found it helpful to arrange the cable so that odd and even numbered wires are splayed apart, then carefully insert the odd numbered wires into the even numbered pads. Using some blue tack to hold the cable in place, I then soldered the entire row, then repeated the whole process putting the even numbered wires into the odd numbered pads. Pads 35 and 36 should be left empty. Since we presumably want the drive connected to this external cable to be drive A, and the CPC expects the drive connected to the internal drive port to be drive A, we need to run a wire from the internal port to the external port. This is explained in issue 91 of Amstrad Action, but basically the wire goes from pin 4 of CD04 to pin 9 of JD04, which is the fifth one from the left on the row of pins closest to the front of the CPC. This allows us to select drive 0, or drive A in CPC language, on the GoTech unit or any other floppy drive with drive number switching. We now need a way to power the drive. In my case it's easy, since the GoTech just needs 5 volts. I just soldered some female to male DuPont wires directly to pins 1 and 2 of connector CD03, pin 1 being 5 volts and pin 2 being ground. I'll make red 5 volts and black ground. If you have a floppy drive that requires 12 volts, you'll have to add some kind of external power supply, which is beyond the scope of this video, but I'll give you a link to some pages explaining it in the video description. Now we can connect everything and test it. The floppy connector goes to the GoTech drive, and the two power connectors go to the power pins on the GoTech. Red goes to the pin marked 5 volts, and ground goes to either of the two middle pins. On the flash floppy firmware at least, you want to remove all of the jumpers except one, which should be on the pins marked S0. If you're using a different firmware, you'll need to consult the documentation for it. Now we power everything up, and hopefully if all goes well, no smoke comes out and we get the boot menu. One way of seeing if the floppy controller works is to drop to basic and just type run quote, or hold control enter and hit enter. If you get a bad command error, that's great! It means that the Amstrad has detected the drive controller. If you get the standard press play then any key prompt, something has gone wrong. Check you remember to install all the components and that your soldering's okay. I flashed my GoTech drive with the flash floppy firmware and installed a little OLED screen, but the procedure is pretty much the same with any GoTech firmware. Load a USB stick full of Amstrad games, select the one you want, and type CAT. With any luck, you should get a directory listing. If it doesn't work, check your soldering, GoTech jumper settings, and flash floppy configuration. If it all works, however, now's the time to enjoy all those plus exclusive disc games like Prehistoric 2 Plus, Fluff, and, um, Jet Set Willy 2 Plus? Anyway, this isn't a game review channel, so check out some channels in my video description for more stuff you can do with this machine. As a bonus, I'll show you how to replace the built-in AMSDOS ROM with Parados, which as well as allowing you to store 800k per disk, also has a super useful file manager built in. Since the CPC Plus range stores its operating system on the system cartridge, this means we need to open up the cartridge and desolder the existing ROM. Since I had well and truly run out of solder braid by this point, I resorted to melting a massive blob of solder across all the pins and prizing the ROM out with a screwdriver. Don't do this, you're likely to tear some of the pads out while you do it. To get the solder out of the holes, I melted each pad in turn, then smacked the PCB against my workbench to dislodge 
dislodge it. Again, don't do this, just use a solder sucker like a normal person. Now we need to make a Parados ROM. We could erase the EEPROM that came with the system cartridge and reprogram it, but I don't have access to my UV lamp thanks to the COVID lockdown, so instead I used an electrically erasable W27C010 ROM that has an identical pinout to the Amstrad EEPROM. You can get the Parados cartridge image from a link in the video description, and it will have to be converted to binary using CPR tools, which I'll also give you a link to. Finally, it can be programmed to the EEPROM using a ROM programmer. I used this super cheap TL866 thing I got on eBay for like 30 quid, and seems to crop up in all my videos somehow. Before soldering it to the system cartridge board, I gave it a quick test in the GX4000 homebrew board I mentioned earlier just to make sure it programmed okay, and success! Instead of getting the burn and rubber basic menu, it just boots straight to basic, and we see that Parados 1.2 is added to the system's boot up messages. Typing pipe drive should bring up the file manager, proving everything works. Burn and rubber is even still here, you access that by typing pipe game. Now we just solder the ROM to the cartridge board, attach a super professional looking label, and we have a complete functioning Parados 1.2 system cartridge. In Parados, we need to configure drive A as 80 track double sided by pressing shift C then D, then we can format a blank image by pressing shift F. The ROM DOS D1 format is most commonly used, and once it's finished formatting you can see that we have nearly 800k free space. This of course even applies when running basic, so you can store a lot more stuff on one disk than you could previously. With everything done, it's time to reassemble the computer. Just screw in all the motherboard screws, clip the top part of the case on, screw in all the case screws, and we're done! I hope this video was helpful to people who are considering upgrading their 464 Plus, and at least interesting to people who aren't. If you like this video and have an interest in retro computing or DJ equipment technology, then consider subscribing to my channel, as I'm always doing little projects like this. Thanks for watching, and stay safe!